Uh, well, let me ask you about the Turing test, which, Barbara, you, <laughs> Sorry. you, you mentioned earlier. Now, my impression was that for a long time, people thought this was the gold standard of artificial intelligence. I mean, could you basically uh, construct a system where you couldn't tell the difference between were you talking to a computer or whether you were talking to a human being? So, um, sorry, I guffawed, and I probably shouldn't have <laughs> gave away my answer. Um, so I want to say first, Alan Turing was absolutely brilliant. I mean, really, he, he started every area of computer science, theoretical computer science, systems, and artificial intelligence, all the, everything except graphics and all the fancy stuff that all the games depend on. Um, he was asking a philosophical question at a time when... Um, the predominant uh, uh, techniques in investigation bio in uh, psychology were behaviorism. So if you do something, what happens? Just seeing that, not looking inside at all. And, and his suggestion of the Turing, t what he called the imitation game, but has now become uh, known as the Turing test, was in that vein. And it's possible. Um, that a machine could not pass, could, could only, let me try and put it in the positive, could only be able to pass the Turing test if it had something like our intelligent behavior. But there are two things to say. First, no, despite what you might have read in the press, no computer has passed the Turing test. Turing did not limit the task to five minutes, one domain, or any of the things that you've read about. And the reason that's important is that every, every program that has, quote, won some modified supposed Turing test has done it by hackery and trickery. Um, that, that's true. Um, <laughs> and the second thing is the Turing test is a very bad way to drive research or even measurement in a field because either a computer passes it or it doesn't. Science proceeds incrementally. I mean, anybody who's a biologist or a physicist or a chemist, even a mathematician knows that you prove a little bit and then you prove more. You find something and then things change. There's no way to test incremental progress toward but the Turing test. Why, why is this so hard for a computer to do, for AI to do, to basically to carry on a conversation so that it basically can uh, can sound or appear to be human. What 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 makes that so difficult? Because carrying on a conversation requires a lot of cognitive capacity. It's not just taking a string and mapping it into something. There's a reason that you can um, that search engines have succeeded so well, and asking individual questions of a computer have succeeded so well, mostly. And yet, if you try and have a dialogue with a system, it goes off the tracks pretty easily, which is why most of these um, consumer advisor systems that you chat with, um, if, if, you don't, if you don't have a problem that matches the script that they've been given, then they can't help you. Um, there was a, a Barbie doll that was announced some years ago that was supposed to be your daughter's best friend. It was on the front page of the New York Times Magazine. It could speak. Um, it was very easy for it to go wrong. And I, had, I uh, have t teach a course on intelligent systems design and ethical challenges. And some of the, the students do a project. And some of the students bought a Barbie doll and experimented with it. And it didn't. It didn't take very long for this Barbie doll to go off the tracks. When you say go off the tracks, what do you mean? Give um, me an example. So I'll give you an example. There's Actually, this dialogue is in the New York Times Magazine. The doll, I won't get the whole dialogue, but the doll um, uh, s uh, finds out that the child has a sister and asks the child what nice things the sister has done for her. And the child says, my sister does nothing nice for me. And the system says, well, tell me one thing she's done. And it, it goes on, and I think it ends with something like, have you told your sister how much you appreciate her these days? <laughs> I mean, so now think about this. I mean, I, I could get on my soapbox about ethics. This is a doll for a child between three and eight when we're hoping to teach children that they should listen to other people 
and this style is stone deaf to the child. <laughs> and it's supposed to be her best friend. Okay, the child at some point is not so nice to the doll, and the doll still smiles back. I have never met an unremittingly pleasant four-year-old, though I have met many adorable four-year-olds. Um, what you know? So there's that's an example. I um, one of my other examples, which um, I use use in the class, I always have to test it ahead of time. So if you go away and try it out and it works, just wait a few weeks and it won't work. You can, <coughs> you can ask your smartphone where the nearest emergency room is and you'll get the nearest emergency room. You can ask it where you should go to get a sprained ankle treated and it might give you a web page that tells you how to treat a sprained ankle. That is, I thank you for laughing. <laughs> Whoever you are, thank you. <laughs> Because that's funny, but if you had asked about getting a stroke victim or a heart attack victim treated, you wouldn't have wanted a web page. You would have wanted somebody to call 911. 